So today I'm continuing on the series on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I'm up to part 12 of this series, with this being part 2 on the gift of tongues and interpretations. And this is the last part. Last time I started teaching on tongues, included in this part will be the interpretation of tongues. Last time I was teaching on different types of tongues and private uses of it, which included what some would call a babbling and also a known tongue like another language. But the speaker had not learnt that before. I don't think it is either or, meaning it has to be one or the other. Or it has to be this or that. I gave some examples in Acts, like when Peter went to the Roman centurion's house and the Holy Spirit came upon the household and they started speaking in tongues. Or when Paul laid his hands on some of the disciples of John and then they also spoke in tongues. Now in these cases we don't know whether it was babblings as we would call it or another language it doesn't say it just said that they spoke in tongues. So if you haven't seen part one of tongues you need to see it before continuing on with this teaching. So last time I spoke about private uses of tongues also this time I'm, I'm going into the public use of tongues. Now one who has been in a Pentecostal charismatic church for any length of time would have no doubt come across people speaking in tongues. It is done all the time as this is the foundation that these movements stand on. Those of operating in the gifts of the Spirit, this is why these movements have their names, being Pentecostals and Charismatics, because it's all to do with Acts chapter 2 and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's why they're called that and predominantly look to uh, operate in those things. And I used to be one of those. Looking at how it is used in modern day times, I have to ask the question, does it line up with what our Bibles teach? This is public tongues we're talking about now. Does what they do or any other church or group, does it line up with what the Bible teaches? We're going through that today. So in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 6 it says, But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? So Paul is saying here, if I come to you speaking in a language, that you do not understand or know, what use is that for you? Whether that is another known language or a babbling, which could be tongues of angels, by the way, the language that God understands, it is pointless unless there is revelation that comes with it, which is interpretation and giving understanding to what was just being said. In these modern day churches and meetings, in my experience, this very rarely happens. There is no interpretation. People are speaking this babbling or another language, whatever it is, but there's many times no interpretation. And then moving on to 1 Corinthians 14 verse 9, this whole chapter, by the way, is predominantly speaks about speaking in tongues publicly. The whole chapter of 1 Corinthians 14 and we're going to work our way through it so we can see what the Bible teaches. So 1 Corinthians 14 verse 9 says, Say likewise you, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken for you, you will be speaking into the air. So in my opinion, in modern, many modern day meetings, there's a lot of speaking in the air because no one's giving any interpretation. There's no understanding. They're speaking out into the air. This is what Paul says. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 11. It says, Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of a language, or of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks. And he who speaks 
will be a foreigner to me. Pretty straightforward. If Jolene starts speaking to me in Afrikaans, I'm a foreigner to her. And if Jolene has someone like another person in our group that starts speaking in Peru, they are a foreigner to her. It's pretty straightforward. If you don't understand the language, you're a foreigner because you can't communicate. This is what Paul is saying here. This was brought up in our discussion after the teaching I did last week. Many times, especially in Messianic circles, people like to get up there with all their Hebrew prayers and reading the text in Hebrew. This is what happens a lot of the times. In Australia, I would say, and I could be wrong, but probably 99.9% .9 of our population doesn't speak Hebrew. If one would go to one of these meetings, they would have absolutely no idea as to what is being said. So then how is that profitable to them? Because they don't understand what's being said. Unless there is given the interpretation of the words. And many times there are no interpretations or revelations given. They get up there and say all these prayers and read the text in Hebrew and no one's got a clue what's going on because there's no revelation. There's no interpretation given. In 1 Corinthians 14 verse 13 it says, Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. Again, it's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. If you do this publicly, there needs to be an interpretation from you or from someone else. It is that simple. It's not complicated. Remembering that this is a gift that's been given by the Holy Spirit as he wills when he wills. Again, in 1 Corinthians 14, verses 18 to 19, and this is Paul again, he's saying, I thank my God that I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church, or in the ecclesia, or more accurately the assembly, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words with a tongue. So speaking with understanding is speaking your native language. It's, it's pretty easy. And it's also speaking the tongue of your audience, the listeners. Now an example of this was when I was much younger. This is a personal testimony. When I was much younger, I preached in Fiji and Vanuatu. Now even though I spoke in my native language English, I needed an interpreter when I was preaching. It's quite a weird experience because you've got to try and keep your mind on track while you're waiting for the interpreter to give an interpretation. So I needed a, an interpreter so the audience could understand what I was saying because they weren't, English wasn't their native language. This is an example of what we're talking about. If you get up there and speak in a language publicly, there needs to be understanding. There needs to be an interpretation given. Paul is saying here, unless there is interpretation, speak the native language. So everyone can profit and hear and understand. Opposite to what happens in many Day, uh, many modern day meetings. They speak 10,000 words in tongues and are not interpreted. It is back to front. It is upside down. Anyone that's been in a uh, Pentecostal meeting, there's a lot of tongues being spoken, a lot of babbling or whatever it is, and there's no interpretation. It's the other way around. Paul teaches you, we should rather speak so everyone can profit and understand. It's, it's totally opposite and totally different. And he's, he says that if, if a tongue happens within a public meeting, there needs to be interpretation. 1 Corinthians 14, 22 to 23. It says, therefore, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. 
but prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. Therefore, when the whole assembly comes together in one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say that you are out of your mind? Unbelievers, when they see, see and hear people speaking in tongues come in, and there is this religious fervor that's with it, and many speaking at the same time, they think these people are out of their mind. They think they're nuts because it's something that's totally foreign to them. But however, it says that tongues is for the unbeliever. And maybe this is part of Acts chapter 2 when the disciples came out speaking in tongues and those that didn't know the, the message of Messiah, when they heard it, they became believers because it said 3,000 were added that day. So maybe that goes along that line. They were unbelieving in the Messiah and then they heard the message preached. 1 Corinthians 14.26 How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm or has a teaching or has a tongue, has a revelation and has an interpretation? Let all things be done for edification. So here we see that Paul's not resisting this gift. Obviously he's teaching it and promoting it and how it should be done. Because he says how is it that everyone comes functioning in some way or the other, which is what is called the body of Messiah, that we all have a function, we all have something to contribute. Paul does encourage tongues, but there are guidelines to it, especially when in a public meeting. In 1 Corinthians 14, 27 to 28, it says, If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two, or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in the assembly, and let him speak to himself and to God. So here we again, we see the guidelines Paul is putting in place and teaching that there should be two or at the most three and that there should then be an interpretation. And if that doesn't happen, well then those people need to sit down and keep silent and keep it between them and God, going back to a private use. Again, this does not happen in most cases in church meetings today. Paul teaches at the most three and one at a time, and not all at once, like in some prayer meetings, where you've got all this stuff going on at once. Totally, again, not what Paul teaches. There also then needs to be interpretation, which does not happen most of the time. 1 Corinthians 14, 39 to 40, it says, Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy, and do not forbid to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. So here again we see that there needs to be order in the public meeting, not a chaos of speaking in tongues or babblings with no interpretation, with 20 or 50 people going all at once. That's again opposite to what Paul teaches when this, when this gift is manifested within the midst. The modern day practice is erroneous and does not follow what our scriptures teach. Again, let, let me remind us that not all speak in tongues, which is what we touched on last week, that not all speak in tongues. It is a gift given by the Holy Spirit, just like all the other gifts. It is given when he wills to give it and not when we will. For a specific time and a place to edify and encourage the body of Messiah. That's what it's for. And like we said last time, privately, it's for our edification and building up. Now I want to move on to the Old Testament uses of this gift. And again, straight up, we see out of Isaiah 28, 11, Yahweh speaking, he says, For with stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to his people. 
It's interesting. And then if you read before and after this, it's talking about precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. So it's all about growing and learning and educating. He will speak with stammering lips and another tongue he will speak to his people. He has done this and continues to do this. Another passage that can reveal the idea of tongues is as follows. In Exodus 19, 8 to 9, Then all the people answered together and said, All that Yahweh has commanded or spoken we, we will do. So Moses brought back the words of the people to Yahweh. And Yahweh said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. So Moses told the words of the people to Yahweh. So the context of this is that we know who stood before Yahweh at Mount Sinai to hear the words. The words, those that we, what we call today the Ten Commandments. We know who stood before them were the Hebrews. Who else stood before them? There was another group called the Mixed Multitude who came out of Egypt with the Hebrews. Now they all heard Yahweh speaking from the top of the mountain. Now, it is possible that when Yahweh spoke, each heard in their own language what Yahweh was saying and understood what was being said for them to say, we will do. Because in the mixed multitude were Egyptians and many other different nations represented within that mixed multitude. Why? Because they were slaves in, 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 in Egypt. And there was different nations and tongues represented within the mixed multitude. So they each heard, it's possible that they each heard their own tongue or language and understood what was being said. There are many, also many associations that happened on this day to the day of the Feast of Weeks, otherwise known as Pentecost in Greek, which is found in Acts chapter 2. That all these visitors from the nations also heard a message in their own language on that same day in Acts chapter 2. So there's an association that goes between Mount Sinai and Acts chapter 2, both believed to be happening on the same day, which is the day as Shavuot, or Pentecost. We know that the Hebrews were before God at Mount Sinai in that period of time of Shavuot, when they left Egypt. It is talked about and believed in Jewish writings that this was also the case at Mount Sinai. In the Jewish writings, they also believe that these people heard in their own language what was being said. Now, for me personally, I have no problem with that at all. I, I believe that God can do that and is quite capable of doing that, but each to their own. Another example is in 1 Samuel, 1, 12 to 15, and it happened. This is Hannah. And she continued praying before Yahweh that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. Now I seem to remember others that were accused of being drunk. In Acts chapter 2, anyway. Verse 14, so Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. And Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord. I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intox intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before Yahweh. Now, there is a prayer that comes from deep within. One might even say, praying in the Spirit. When one has a heavy heart or words just are not enough, this is also considered a language. Praying in the Spirit, if you will. The fruit of this was her prayer was heard. I always say, look at the fruit. When we see the fruit, her prayer was heard. In our culture today, we have languages in different forms and here are some, just to name a few. We have our own native language, it's obvious. There are languages of other nations. 
then there are just some languages that are just not spoken much, like music. Music is all, also a language. There is body language. If I sat here with my cross, arms crossed and my face scowled, I'm, I'm talking. Someone said, I don't know how true it is, but they say that 80 to 90% of communication is nonverbal. Body language. There is also computer language. A well-known Christian book was written called The Five Love Languages. Describing and explaining how different people respond to different actions within relationships. Some like to be encouraged, some like receiving gifts. These are different languages within relationships. Even silence can be a language. Especially if one partner in a marriage is silent when angry and upset. That speaks a lot. <laughs> and we all <laughs> who have been married, <laughs> we're laughing because we've experienced that. Nonverbal language, quite powerful. Or if someone won't give an answer and says, stay silent. We say that they're speaking louder than words when they stay silent. We're hearing them loud and clear through their silence. So even silence can be a language. In our culture, we see languages play out in a variety of ways. I believe this to be seen in another Hebrew way in the Bible. Now, another form I want to share with you and believe to be re relevant is similar to what I just went through with Hannah. So I believe this form of a language to be relevant. That's why I'm talking about it today. And this is the Nagoon, which is actually a Hebrew word, a Nagoon. And the idea of a Nagoon, which is a noon, a gimel, and a final noon. The meaning of a Nagoon is literally wordless sounds that come from plucking the strings of instruments. Now, I remember when someone did this for a certain king, it soothed him and caused him to have peace. Remember David and King Saul. David played his lyre or his harp. Wordless noises that brought peace. Here's some examples. And the, Ur the Urban Dictionary explains a Jewish song or portion of a song where no words are sung. But syllables such as la 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 or na 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 or ni 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 in a very spiritual way. Musically compar comparable to scat singing in jazz, but obviously much more spiritual. Another meaning of Nagoon, stories behind Hasidic songs that inspire Jews. And this I found in my research, hungry, a Jew searches because his Jewish soul won't let him rest until he has come to hear what he needs to hear and to say what he needs to say. Hungry, he turns to music when words fail and he looks up to him and sings his heart out. With the right intent, any Jew who sings a nigun always reaches his creator. In a sense, a nagoon is a combination of parent-child sounds that no one else can understand. A stammering infant language God created for us when our feelings are too delicate or too intimate for others to hear. And I thought, what a amazing meaning. And another example, a nagoon is not known words springing forth from our minds, filtered through a known language. A nagoon is a song of the heart, a melody unto Yahweh. It is taught that a nagoon is a gift from God. Now this is Jewish. These aren't Messianics. These are Orthodox Jewish meanings. It is taught that a nagoon is a gift from God and will be sung by Jews when they go out to meet the Mashiach or the Messiah. And I want to share an ancient story concerning the Nagoon. It is indeed a story or perhaps a tale, and whether it actually happened or not is not the point. 
The point is the subject of the story and the common knowledge of a language that is not a known language. There is a legendary story about Rabbi Shneer Zalman of Liadi. In his time, there was no great love between the house of Shammai and the house of Hillel. They hated each other. The house of Shammai deemed themselves to be the intellectuals. A group of them from the house of Hillel confronted the Rebbe from the house of Shammai one day with question after question. The Rebbe entertained every question but did not answer them. Then he took them all into one room and began to sing a nagoon. Everyone heard the same nagoon, but everyone heard his own answer to his own question. He spoke in one voice, but they all heard the answer to their own question. The, divide, the difference to today and ancient times is that these were sung and not spoken. Similar to the Psalms today, we speak the Psalms that were once sung. The sounds of this melody were likened unto the sounds of the plucking of lyres or harps. This is no less evident in the occurrences of a nagoon in scripture. And we actually sung some Psalms today. And the person that put the songs together didn't even know about this connection. We actually sung, went back to the old ways and sung some of the psalms today, rather than speak the psalms. You'll remember when David and the others wrote these psalms, they were sung. They were sung songs and, and instruments played unto Yahweh. And we find here in the King James Version of Psalm 4.1, and it says to the chief musician on Neginoth. That's our Hebrew word. Neginoth, a psalm of David, hear me when I call. That's communication, that's language. O God of my righteousness, thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. Now I look at this same psalm in another translation, which is the New King James. So in the top you see the Neginoth in the King James. In the New King James, it says, to the chief musician with stringed instruments, which is that meaning of Nagoon and playing the harps and the lyres. A psalm of David, hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have relieved me of my stress, had mercy on me, and hear my prayer. So he's in an attitude of prayer when he's singing. It's a, it's a Nagoon with instruments. Isaiah 38, 20. And it says, Yahweh was ready to save me. Therefore, we will sing my songs with stringed instruments all the days of our life in the house of Yahweh. So here we see again the nagun, the, the connection. It's the same Hebrew word. It's actually nagan in these couple of instances, but it has the same root. And it's connected to the language of music with stringed instruments. I mentioned David and King Saul before. In 1 Samuel 16.23 it says, And so it was, whenever the Spirit from God was upon Saul, that David would take a harp and play it with his hands. Then Saul would come, uh, would become refreshed and well, and the distressing spirit would depart from him. Again, this word play is the nagun, nagan. So we see that this gift came upon David and we see the fruit of it, that the distressing spirit left Saul. So that unspoken language brought peace and, and, and helped Saul. Here are some more modern day examples. Now, who has seen The Fiddler on the Roof? In the movie on The Fiddler on the Roof, you may recall Tevi singing and dancing in the barn with cows and chickens as he dreams about Sunday having material wealth. He begins to burst out in the song and it goes, I'm not going to sing it, I'll just speak it. But he says, if I were a rich man, 
Yabba dibi 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 dum. All day long I'd biddy biddy bum if I were a wealthy man. Now, according to the co writer of this song, Sheldon Harnick, this was a, written in a Kel, Kelsma style based on Hasidic Niganim. Who would have thought? Or do you think the writers just couldn't think of a line to rhyme with a rich man? We see this play out. Now, another song that most of us would have probably heard of. Zippity dee da, zippity day. I'll say that again. Zippity doo da, zipper dee day. From 1946 animated movie Song of the South. It was composed by Ali Rubel, who was a composer and songwriter. He was a Jewish man who wrote Zippity Doo Da Zippity Day. I wonder where he was inspired to write that or insert that into the song. Zippity Doo Da Zippity Day. I wonder how that come about. Just a coincidence he was a Jewish man. There is also a song called in, in modern days, Roni Roni, Batsy On. Roni Roni, Batsy On. And uh, Paul Wilbur is one of the ones that's seen that today. Here it is on your screen, Roni Roni, Batsy On. And it says, Rejoice, Rejoice, Daughter of Zion. Shout aloud to Israel. Sing, Rejoice with all your heart, O Jerusalem. The words Rejoice, Rejoice are English translations of the Hebrew words Roni Roni. These words come from the root Rana in Hebrew. The etymology of this word means to make unique sounds. See, to us in our modern day English, rejoice, rejoice, we, we could go woohoo, yeehaw, whoopee. They're unique sounds. But in, in Hebrew culture, like this rejoicing can mean spinning in a dance. There's so many things in Hebrew that don't line up with our modern day understanding of these words. So this, the etymology of rana means to make unique sounds, i.e. not a previously known language. It is translated as joy, rejoice, a noise and a cry. Unique sounds. 1 Kings 8.28 Yet regard the prayer of your servant and his supplication, O Yahweh my God, and listen to the cry. That's this word regard. Unique sounds. Listen to my cry. See, when we think of cry in English, we think of it in a certain way. We see here that this person was deep in prayer. It says, and the prayer which your servant is praying before you today. So he's already in his mindset and his attitude of prayer. Unique sounds. That way he was crying out. Making these unique sounds to God. I believe we need to be careful not to put the Holy Spirit in our little boxes, whereby thinking if we don't understand it at the time, well then it's wrong, rather than keeping it in mind and putting it on the shelf. A bit like Joseph's dad Jacob, when Joseph had his dreams and said even his mother and father would bow down to him and worship. I think we need to be like that and put it on the shelf if we don't totally get it or agree with it at this point in time. I believe that the Holy Spirit interacts in our lives as he deems to be so fit when he chooses. If a circumstance calls for a supernatural ability to speak a known language that you did not previously know, then the Spirit of Yahweh will speak through you. And we touched on some examples of that last week. If the Spirit needs to speak to more than one person at the same time, then He is perfectly capable of speaking an unknown language through you that each person hears in their own language. 
We saw that in Acts chapter 2, and, and I believe it happened in the Exodus before Mount Sinai. If you just want to cry out to God and do not have the words to say, then he will speak through you a language that your father knows. This is the Holy Spirit I'm talking about. will speak through you a language that the Father knows and understands. Please let us not limit the Holy Spirit by our own presuppositions and personal experiences. So now I'll move on to the spiritual gift of interpretation of tongues. Interpretation of tongues. This gift is different in that it needs the speaking of tongues to be used. Or as also can be seen in the Old Testament, it needs someone to have a dream so that the dream can be interpreted. So this gift of the, the gift of interpretation is different from all the other gifts in that it doesn't stand alone like the others do. It needs, the, it needs tongues or it needs a dream to take place. So then you can have the interpretation of it. We find this in 1 Corinthians 12.10. And it says, To one the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kind of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. The same person who speaks a tongue can also interpret that tongue, or another person can interpret the tongue also. 1 Corinthians 14.13, it says, Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. This is where the interpretation comes in. 1 Corinthians 14, 27 to 28. If anyone speaks a tongue, let there be two or at the most three each in turn and let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in the assembly and let him speak to himself and to God. So we need interpretation when it's done publicly. Two Greek words are used for interpretation in the verses I just went through. And the first one is herma, hermanenia, hermanenia. And it means interpretation, explanation, and translation. As an endowment of the spirit, the ability to make words intelligible that would otherwise not be understood. Makes sense. Just like when I preached in the island nations, I needed an interpretation so they could understand it. This is where we get the word hermeneutics from. Now, hermeneutics is very, very important idea to grab hold of, especially when you're studying the Bible. Hermeneutics is the theory and methodology of interpretation, especially the interpretation of biblical texts. Now, in the academic world, in the scholar world, there are rules that govern hermeneutics. They're, they're guide rails that, that, that people need to apply when they're studying the Bible so they don't go off on all these mythological weird tangents. Hermeneutics is actually like a science to text, ancient text. And there's guidelines to, be, uh, to keep us safe when we do that. The other Greek word is diermeneo, and it means to unfold the meaning of what is said, explain and expound, to translate into one's native language. So we see this same idea of interpretation play out with Joseph when he interpreted the dreams of the cupbearer, the baker, and also the dreams of Pharaoh. We also see this with Daniel interpreting the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. They, what did they both say? They both said, do not interpretations belong to God. It is a gift. The Holy Spirit gave them the gift of interpretation. At a certain point, at a certain time to bring God glory. Joseph, both Joseph and Daniel were both given a gift by the Holy Spirit of interpretation. And we see the fruit of it. Again, we see the fruit of it, of what happened. A Hebrew word for interpretation is pithron. 
and it simply means interpretation. This is what you'll find in the story of Joseph. Now, in the story of Daniel, you'll find the Aramaic word because Daniel is written in Aramaic. The Aramaic word is Hesha, and it means interpretation. Now, these both have the same root from Pa. Pa meaning to break open to reveal fruit. How amazing is that? Especially in light of the teachings earlier to do with the seed and the fruit that that is in the seed. Interpretation is a, a concrete natural meaning is to break open to reveal the fruit. I think it's amazing meaning for all interpretation, especially when we are talking about proper hermeneutics for biblical text. To sum up, there are various tongues used privately and publicly. There are gifts given by the Holy Spirit at a certain time for a certain purpose. Not all speak with tongues. Again, it is a gift given by the Holy Spirit as He wills and not when we will. It is for the edification of oneself in their own prayer time with God and also for the edification of the body when used publicly. There must be interpretations to these when used publicly, which is also a gift given by the Holy Spirit. The same as was given to Joseph and Daniel to interpret dreams. Once again, these were given at a certain place and time to give God glory. And I would like to also add this, that I also believe that music and singing are also gifts given to people for worshipping and praying to God. That there are those that are gifted in these areas to lead people and assist in worship and prayers to God. So I think music has, is, is a gift given to people as well. Whether it's playing instruments or their voice or whatever, I think they are to benefit and bless the body. Especially that assist of those of us who can't really sing very well. And let's finish on this. 2 Timothy 1 6. Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. So we need to stir up the gift that God has given us and seek his gifts and, and seek to be used by him. As we have seen over the last few months now, we've been talking on the gifts for a few months. I believe that all the gifts are for all the believers today. They are for the body of Messiah. Yeshua left the Holy Spirit to help, lead and guide. We have been given these wonderful gifts to bless the body, to encourage and exhort as we see the day approaching. They are all functions within the body to be used to help and bless each other. Just like a bridegroom sent gifts to the waiting bride to encourage her that he was coming for her soon, though our groom tarries, he has given us the gifts by his Holy Spirit also known as the helper to encourage, to bless and uplift us while we're waiting for our bridegroom to come and get us. We are to seek and desire to have the gifts bestowed upon us to be used in the hand of our master. All of God's fruit comes forth from his seed, which is his word. Someone once said that we have not because we ask not. May we be a people that ask to receive and to work and manifest his gifts in our lives. We have not because we ask not. Well, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you haven't left us as orphans. You sent your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the gifts that come with the Holy Spirit to help to encourage us and to edify and to build the body of Messiah. Father, also to be able to minister to those who are outside so that, that one day they may also become partakers 
can become within the body. Father, I pray you, work, you, you teach in your word that we are to zeal, zealously seek your gifts. And Father, help us as we meditate and as we go over the, 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 your gifts, help us to understand. Father, help us to understand. And Father, we just ask that you that these gifts would, that would manifest and display themselves among us. Father, that we would be a people that want to encourage, edify, minister, serve, pray for each other, especially as we see the day approaching. We thank you again, Father, for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your gifts. And we also thank you for your word. For your word is truth. And we bless you in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Thank you for taking the time to watch this teaching. I would like to ask you if you would hit the like button and the subscribe button. This will help us get our teachings out in front of many, many more people. And also to turn on the notification bell so that you will receive an alert for when the latest teaching comes out. I would also like to encourage you that if you are ministered to and blessed by this teaching, that you would share your thoughts and your comments in the section below. Thank you. Thank you for watching. We pray that this teaching has been a blessing to you. For more information, please go to www.ancientfoundationbiblefellowship.com. Shalom.